Okay, thanks very much, Daryl. Uh, this is going to be a very quick skate through a number of thoughts around biosecurity for the future and the implications in particular for Northern Australia. So Lynn's touched in broad terms on the current biosecurity situation, but I just want to highlight a few other points and lead into the North. So clearly we understand what biosecurity is about. It's about the management of risks to a range of sectors focused on pests and diseases that we don't want in Australia. But if we think about the biosecurity itself, it's, it's an outcome we're trying to achieve, but it's also a system, an interacting system that again, Lynn touched on some of the, the elements of the system. But importantly, it's a human system. It's designed by people, it's run by people, and it's very often compromised by people. And that human dimension of biosecurity, I think we need to think about much more seriously as we evolve the system, improve it, particularly around Northern Australia. We've got a large challenge in trying to protect the values we have, the health of our people, the exports we're able to uh, produce and deliver, and the environment that we have. So multi-dimensional issues here. And across the continuum of biosecurity, from offshore to the border and onshore, science contributes a great deal and can continue to do that in better understanding risk offshore, understanding pathways of entry, how organisms establish, spread, and then have impact, and where on that chain we can have interventions that try to stop that impact as early as possible. But at the same time, in supporting market access, so biosecurity science supporting our capacity to trade and export. <clears throat> if we look at biosecurity today and some of the, uh, the headlines, we're very regularly seeing scary headlines about uh, threats, changes, things coming, impacts happening in other parts of the world, things that we don't want. So if you were to look just at the headlines, you, you probably would be really concerned. I think in the global uh, environment today, it's right to be concerned because the world is changing very rapidly. In 2012, CSIRO released a report on global megatrends that uh, impact Australia or look at where Australia fits in a changing global pattern. And you can see the six main megatrends there. And if you think about those, each of them has some biosecurity connotation. So more from less, essentially around improved efficiency in agriculture, for example, leading to greater intensification that can generate heightened biosecurity risks through more concentrated populations of organisms, for example. Going, going, gone about the loss of biodiversity it can compromise our environments in terms of their resilience to invasion. Uh, the Asian century, clearly about trade, movement, connection, that again heightens risk. <clears throat> Great expectations, the changing expectations of our, our communities and what they understand about risk and, and what, where they think food comes from. Di and virtually here about a digitally connected world, that's probably a real positive for us and I'll emphasise that as we go forward, that the digital opportunities in enhancing biosecurity are substantial. So that report led us uh, just over a year ago to work up uh, together with our partners in Animal Health Australia, Planned Biosecurity CRC and the Invasive Animals CRC, a futures report on biosecurity, uh, Australia's biosecurity future, preparing for future biological challenges. We did this report through wide consultation with about 60 organisations across the country, lots of interviews, lots of workshops and tried to pull together a similar megatrend analysis around the biosecurity megatrends. And we came up with five and then explored those by looking at a series of mega shocks and scenarios around those shocks and how we might currently respond. You can see we identified five. Appetite for change is clearly about the growing requirement for food, increased agricultural productivity, and driving intensification that, as I said earlier, can drive uh, increases in either new or increased biosecurity uh, risks. The urban mindset is essentially about the growing disconnect between where most of our people are and where most of our food and agriculture is. The lack of understanding of biosecurity risks from urban populations and the growing uh, peri-urban, suite of peri-urban agriculture that brings its own set of risks. On the move is clearly about connectedness. Australia is no longer a, a, an isolated island. We're hugely connected and that's growing through 
shipping, containerization, people movements, each representing a potential biosecurity risk. The diversity dilemma is uh, similar to what it was in the megatrends analysis. It's really about how biodiversity underpins the functioning of many of our, our ecosystems and invasive species, whether they impact in agriculture or the environment, can compromise those systems and potentially facilitate the establishment of uh, organisms we don't need in the country. And the efficiency er error was the fifth one. And this is really about changing patterns of investment, loss of expertise in certain areas. And if you look across the spectrum of biosecurity in Australia at the moment, we're seeing dramatic reductions in capability and capacity in biosecurity, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, the efficiency era is bringing a, a dramatic rise in technological opportunity to deal with smarter biosecurity systems. So they're the five um, trends that we came up with, and you can read the full report if you wish. It's on our website. In the report, we didn't provide solutions to all those areas. What we did was pose a series of questions because we wanted to keep the dialogue going, but we posed those questions under headings of policy, science and technology, communication and engagement. And we talked about prevention activities and response activities. So the purpose of the report was to get a dialogue started not to provide an Im immediate set of solutions. But what does all that mean for Northern Australia? Well, you're all very well aware of the current uh, interest, energy, around development of Northern Australia. Northern agriculture is currently uh, small relative to the value of agriculture in most of the country, dominated by pastoral enterprises but with huge potential, or at least some potential. There's arguments both ways about the scale of the potential, but opportunities for changed development, not only in agriculture, but in other industries. So there's a lot of momentum, and there are significant needs to support that momentum. There is, unfortunately, a past history of spectacular failures of agricultural developments in Northern Australia. Uh, some of those linked to biosecurity issues, not all. But I'd argue that uh, since the six, 60s, when uh, cotton uh, spectacularly failed in the Ord, we've had a massive amount of science advancement. And if we can't now put in place more science-informed biosecurity systems to support development, then I think we've been negligent. So I'm quite optimistic that we can, but it's important that biosecurity is at the table in the development discussions to ensure that that underpinning is there. When we think about needs for the North, we, we need to not just think about the agricultural sectors, but the human populations as well, because they're going to be integrated into the, the threats and think about our Northern environment, which is pristine in many parts of Northern Australia. So multiple sectors to be considered, but there are unique pathways and threats in Northern Australia that perhaps we don't have to deal with elsewhere in the country. All sorts of natural connections to countries further north through natural dispersal of organisms into the north, uh, itinerant yachts, uh, real connections across Torres Strait that open up different pathways perhaps to consider and perhaps riskier pathways to take into account. And from the developing Northern Australia white paper, recognition that not only is the tropical north perhaps more uh, accepting more receptive for pests and diseases to establish and have impact, but the North can act as a significant stepping stone for invasive organisms to establish and then have impact in our major established agricultural system. So multiple dimensions there to be aware of and guard against. Development in the North will bring increasing threats and susceptibility, so the, co the uh, connection of Northern Australia to neighbouring countries and the trading and so on that goes on between those countries in a relatively unmanaged uh, agricultural biosecurity context relative to our own rises risks offshore that we need to take account of. The scale of movement of goods and people and the movement of, of uh, equipment and people associated with development in itself raises risks of likelihood of entry. Increasing densities of people, livestock, cropping, whatever, increases the chance of those pests and diseases establishing and spreading if we're not on top. And then changing climates 
change the whole dimension around the potential of certain organisms to, uh, to establish in Australia. So all of those aspects mean that we need to be ahead of the game in thinking about those threats. It doesn't mean we say northern development uh, shouldn't happen. Australia has been really well served for 25 years now by the North Australian Quarantine Strategy, NARCS, um, that was set up specifically to deal with the biosecurity risks of northern Australia. Targeted surveillance, really focusing on the, the risks around Torres Strait, for example. So NARCS, I think, has been a, a great success. But in this evolving era, we really need to see it bolstered through smarter technologies, engagement more broadly with the community and industries, and enhanced capacity in state jurisdictions that are uh, obviously present in northern Australia. A couple of case studies to illustrate. One is the classic case of sugarcane smut, uh, a fungus that affects sugarcane in Southeast Asia. Australia was historically free of that, uh, that disease. In 1998, a tiny area of sugar growing in the Ord River, which had not had sugar before, became infected by sugarcane smut that was blown in from somewhere in Asia, uh, almost certainly Timor, Indonesia, established, created a hazard there, but within a short number of years arrived and impacted on our main sugar production area and led to a significant loss and significant transition that had to be undertaken to deal with that. And that's a good example of this stepping stone risk that Northern Australia might pose. So that's a clear case study that illustrates what we need to take account of. Another one that's perhaps more related to human health but is nonetheless a biosecurity risk linked to invasion of novel organisms is uh, mosquito vector diseases and new mosquito vectors spreading in northern Australia or arriving in northern Australia. The Asian tiger mosquito is something we absolutely don't want in Australia. It's in the Torres Strait now. A good job is being done at holding it at bay but we need more sustainable solutions to keep that sort of threat out of the country. Uh, Lynn highlighted marine biosecurity. I just wanted to emphasise the vulnerability that is there. We've got a huge coastline. We've got a number of invasive marine organisms. And with growing development of northern Australia, perhaps new port developments, more shipping, more movements, the risk to our marine estate is also growing. I don't think there's enough going on to protect it at the moment. So some initiatives. Obviously, the, the white paper, as Lynn said, is focused on opportunities for large-scale agriculture in the north, strengthening of biosecurity in particular, and perhaps a northern development CRC. We'll see how that goes. And significant investments, not just in biosecurity, but in infrastructure that facilitates development. Likewise, in the Agricultural Competitiveness White Paper, a number of uh, foci there, and again, significant investment, particularly the 200 million to enhance biosecurity surveillance. These are great initiatives that uh, will really improve the situation. But if we look at our, I guess, our perspective of a way forward for northern biosecurity in particular, we think it needs to be built on multiple components. Firstly, to ensure that there's research and development in place, building on the history of our understanding of the North from the last several decades, but targeted R&D that is focused around risks particularly linked to development for the North. We need to characterise what those risks are and provide decision support tools that uh, can help developments progress uh, with biosecurity in mind. We need to have cost-effective biosecurity plans to support those developments into the future. And perhaps most importantly is be deploying, developing and deploying new technologies. The massive uh, increase in capability with autonomous systems, sensor-based uh, surveillance, uh, big data collection, analytics, the opportunity to get to real-time surveillance so that we can respond very quickly and protect uh, northern developments is, is real and can be done very cost-effectively and helps to I guess fill in the, the, short, the shortage of expertise that's physically located in the north in, in terms of people. So autonomous systems, sensors, new technologies of all sorts can really underpin northern development. Just to focus on smart surveillance, one of the things we'd 
really advocate is it needs to start from a strategic human framework, really drawing in the various elements of communities in the north, particularly the indigenous uh, groups, the indigenous ranger groups, around a, a, a social contract for enhanced surveillance, understanding the risks from natural spread and incursions, and as I said, we've seen a few of those happen already. We're already well advanced with developing a tool that helps us uh, understand those risks from wind, windborne incursions in particular, a, a tool called TAPAS that we're developing jointly with the Bureau of Meteorology that uh, will be very valuable for the North. Fully utilising autonomous systems, as I said, and thinking something like the Sense-T system in Tasmania, sensorised Tasmania, that uh, for Northern Australia would seem a bigger challenge, but something that should be doable. And then adapting all the other tools, particularly social media tools, that can underpin uh, responsiveness and engage as many parts, of, as many facets of the northern community as possible in understanding biosecurity risks, surveillance and response. The outcome there would be government, industry and community all interacting in this shared responsibility that uh, Lynn talked about. So if we think about biosecurity risks for Northern Australia, I think we should think about needs rather than risks. So we know there are risks, but I think they can be managed, or we think they can be managed. We need to see collaboration across jurisdictions, industries and the community, and I think that sense is, is really starting to mobilise. Carefully assess the risks, do whatever we can to preempt those risks. So surveillance, preemptive responses to nip those risks in the bud early integrate infrastructure into developments, rather than seeing developments happen and then biosecurity thought about as an afterthought or responding to a crisis. It should be there at the start. Applying smart technologies and seeing biosecurity as insurance for northern development, not just more red tape. So a couple of final messages. Biosecurity is about investment in long-term sustainability. Done wrong, biosecurity is always going to be generating risk. It's going to be the source of uncertainty, risk, and development and investment doesn't need uncertainty. Done right, biosecurity can be a real enabler of, uh, of development, establishing and maintaining access to markets, supporting trade, uh, and supporting sustainable economic returns. And it's really biosecurity done right that we need to aim for for northern development. So thanks very much.